Hi, Reese. Thank you. So, interestingly, quite quite a few things I've got written down on, on what I was going to cover. You you've kind of touched on already. Um, so, it links in quite nicely, which is good. So, you've asked asked to talk about taster sessions. Um, so, if we go back, I think it was either either Stuart or I'm not. I missed who it was. It was Stuart or Julia was talking about um, with their youngsters. Um, they really enjoy those fun game sessions, but then when we try and be a bit more directive, they, they switch off a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's kind of two, two ends of the spectrum um, when we're running our taster sessions. We can either be at the controlling end, this end, or we can be at the non-controlling end. Um, so obviously those, those fun games type sessions where they're splashing around and having fun and jumping in and, and doing, doing weird stuff is more at the non-controlling end. And then obviously when we're going, we're going to now teach you to forwards paddle and this is how we do it and this is how we sit and our paddle goes in here and we do this and that. That's kind of heading towards that controlling end. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of a balancing act, isn't it? Because the controlling end of stuff will work with some people and their non-controlling approach will work with other people so it's being able to mix and match a little bit and, and pull out so so i missed i missed who gave us the example but what 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 tasks and exercises could we set that would be fun yeah but would also get an outcome out of it and that's that's something i'm not going to answer now because there's loads and loads out there but for example if we were working on um forward paddling in our white water kayaks um, and we set up a game a game of um, tag and we put a condition around it that said you can only paddle forwards yeah so they would be having lots of fun playing tag but they would also be doing lots and lots and lots and lots of forward paddling yeah and then you could you could throw in some more fun stuff by going if you don't paddle forwards or if i catch you doing something other than paddling forwards we could put a, a, a forfeit in there so they might have to spin around on the spot by only paddling forwards on one side or something like that. Yeah, that may kind of kind of make sense. Um, and again, with, with what Steve was saying there about um, about subs, um, and, I, and I think Reese was exactly right there. So so people people achieve really quickly on a sup. So again, if we if we if we go back to our taster sessions, where we need to think about um, setting people up for success rather than failing so um if if for example we wanted if our focus again was around forwards paddling on our taster session and we put everybody in a spinny boat what's their success rate likely to be in that first 20 minutes half an hour it's going to be fairly low isn't it yeah because they're going to be spinning around and around in circles so maybe maybe if we're using white water kayaks that spin quite well we should be focusing on other things like spinning. And if our focus is about paddling forwards in a straight line and we want success, then maybe we should be putting people in boats that will do that. So, uh, so a straight running boat, uh, a sea kayak or, or a touring boat that will do that. Because again, as, as somebody else mentioned um, earlier on, if, if we're not getting success, then we lose interest and we get demotivated. So, so let's let's think about what we're doing. Think about the task we're setting, um, and try and include that, that. There's some success there. And again, in those taster sessions, we're not looking for the perfect footwear. What is a perfect forward paddling stroke? What is a perfect draw stroke? Yeah. So as long as we can make that boat move forwards, um, and we've got some control, or we can make it move sideways. Surely, surely that's okay at that, that early stages. Um, other things we've got written down is, is, um, is thinking about setting tasks. So on that non-controlling end, let them go and play with stuff. So give them a parameter, an area to work in, set them some tasks to go and play with. Go and play with somebody else with those tasks. Watch each other, see if they can help each other out. Yeah, so straight away then they're observing people, they're learning from um and learning themselves um and it's kind of kind of them they'll start developing those mechanics and developing the skills they need 
So, you know, one of the biggest things in paddle sport is balance. You know, whether we're sitting down in a canoe or sitting down in a kayak, kneeling in a canoe, standing up on a paddle board, balance is critical. If people can't balance, they're not going to paddle. So what, what balancing games can we play? What balancing tasks can we set up? Yeah, before we even start moving around the water and, and, and paddling about. Um, just trying to look at my list of things there. Um, so yeah, lots, lots of games, lots of tasks. So, we, so, so terminology we're using on paddle sport instructor courses now is, is games with aims. So, so what, what game can we set up? Uh, and why are we doing it basically what's it what's the outcome of that game so it could be a paddling a paddling forward game it could be a stopping it could be a going sideways it could be a balancing game um it could just be a fun game because everyone's got fed up with being taught how to paddle so now we just want to spend 15 20 minutes having some fun yeah um jumping in and out of different boats is really useful as well if we can do that because that gives people that experience earlier on in those taster sessions to go, actually, I really like canoeing, I really like kayaking, or that sea kayak's brilliant, or I want to be on a stand-up paddleboard. Because um, as long as they're out paddling, that's cool. That's what we want. Um, just checking my notes again. Um, yeah, and then, and then the, the, you know, the, only, the only time that non-controlling might need to suddenly turn into controlling is if we've got a, a, a safety issue or a rescue to happen. And I'm sure most of you have had games of tag going on or polo going on, you know, and somebody goes splash and falls in. So that's, that's when we need to, need to jump onto the more controlling end of the scheme. Cool. Um, there are resources out there. There's resources on the uh, British Canoeing Awarding website um, that, that covers stuff on games with aims. Um, Reese will be able to put you in contact or, or, or should be able to, line you up with some resources as well if that's useful um but say that just to, just to go back a little bit so the new the new paddle sport instructor course that went live last year um predominantly it doesn't it doesn't teach people how to teach or how to coach in the the traditional sense it teaches them how to organize and supervise if you want lots of fun sessions um, and that's 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 kind of where the ethos is going is about these fun sessions and and as say a person said earlier um that's what people want they want to do that and it's then how do we pull out what we need from there um you know how how could have a, have a think about how you could do um how could you run a discover or an explore award assessment by just getting people to do those tasks so rather than going, I want you to paddle from here to there forwards, how, how can we rephrase that and make, make that a task that's fun rather than, the, rather than an, almost an assessment task? Cool. Any, any questions on any, any of that stuff, which, which links quite a lot to the motivation side of stuff and that self-determination theory? Um, because again, that's, that's about people wanting to be there. Um, uh, and what we're really good at, or what we seem to be really good at, generally, is getting people in the door. Um, and what we struggle at is keeping that longer-term motivation and, and keeping them going. Um, and, that's, and that's partly because people, again, have got different motivations and, and, and different lifestyles, isn't it? Any questions? Any comments? Okay. At, at what point would you expect... Uh to get people to capsize you know the old-fashioned capsize drill we used to do it you know all at, quite early on in the in the first sessions of people uh coming along but nowadays uh in our club setting we rarely uh do it but yet uh, is it something we should uh do more at the beginning of people coming along or can it wait for a while it's, it's Ju Julian, isn't it? Hi, Julian. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's completely and entirely up to you, up to them. Yeah. When, when, when do they feel confident enough to do that? Yeah. Um, sure. What? It's just that uh, it came up last year. We had a lad who was probably 13-ish um, and had been coming along to our outdoor sessions for about four months. And then you know, we realised he hadn't capsized in all that time. Um, and at the point we did 
we had to force him to capsize and it turns out really he, he, he couldn't swim and uh, was very, very panicky and perhaps it was something we should have found out earlier on. <clears throat> yeah. Um, again, it, it, it depends on the environment, doesn't it? So, so most, most white water kayaks have got big enough cockpits that without a spray deck on, somebody's just going to fall out if they do go over. So it's not a major safety issue. Um, poss possibly, yes, we need to be aware if somebody's uh, a swimmer, a non-swimmer, or they're water confident early on. So that might be something something you explore early on. Um, it sounds like you have pretty good balance if he'd, if he'd done 13 sessions or whatever, X amount of sessions and still hadn't fallen in. Um, yeah. But again, it just it depends, doesn't it? Well, you know, so if we, if we were quite keen to see how people were early on and the weather was good and we're outdoors, then maybe we set some games up that might end up with people falling in just to see what their reaction is. You know, but that, that needs to be carefully managed, doesn't it? So I think, I think we've gone away from that. You know, when I started paddling 20, 30 years ago, it was, it was almost the first thing you did was a capsize drill, wasn't it? Regardless of the weather or the environment, it was, that's what you did. You did a capsize drill. Um, you know, and I wonder how many people got put off by that first experience. Um, with the design and shape of boats now, it's not as critical because most people will fall straight out of a huge cockpit. Um, and certainly an open boat, they're just going to go splosh straight into the water. So it's not, it's not a, a safety scary issue. Um, so that, yeah, there, there is no yeah, right, I, or, I think, right or wrong. I think the thing, thing that alarmed us was his reaction and how uh, panicky he became, which you know, in that control situation wasn't a problem at all. Yeah. But had it happened somewhere out around the rock, somewhere on the sea, and then he was panicking as well as having to rescue him. It was something we, we should have known, but uh, yeah, um, it was fine. But um, yeah, we just needed to be aware that uh, we need to test people probably a bit earlier on than we do. Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 work, I work in the outdoor industry and part of, part of our signing in process is people declare whether they can swim, whether they're water confident, whether they're a non-swimmer. Oh, he said he could swim. <laughs> All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Which didn't help. <laughs> yeah. And so did his mum. <laughs> ah, that's not good then, is it? <laughs> no. So hand you, hand you back over to Reese. Thank you very much. Sure.